This week in Beginning Painting, we are going to strike off on another subject. So far we've done objects, landscape, and architecture. And of our basic subjects, portraiture and figures are kind of the last of the four major ones. After that, you start combining them and start to make things interesting. This time we're gonna continue and go back to an even more simplified palette. We're going back to just black, white, and gray. It'll wind up being a three-tone palette. So to do this, what you're going to do is begin with black and white, and you're gonna do a simple uh, black, white, noton painting. And noton is just another way of saying whatever is in shadow is black, whatever is in light is white. And you don't say take a dark area that's in the light and make that black because that's not going to be workable for the method that we're going to use. That will come in later. Right now we're simplifying our decisions down just to deciding what is light, what is dark. And that also allows us to focus on the main part of what comes across in a painting, which is the shape. I like to paint relatively small for, for studies because it takes up less paint, A, and it's somewhat easier to manage overall. It's quick, it's easier to cover everything. So I'm using um, just acrylic paint and a six by eight piece of watercolor block. And what I like to do in terms of shape is find big shapes first. I think things can get very difficult if you try to get in, hone in on small shapes really early on because it it's sort of like buying a postage stamp um, when you should be buying a house, right? Like get the whole large areas covered in paint and then go from there. I think one of the biggest advantages to thinking of the, the noton is you get enough down very quickly that you can kind of judge how the shapes are going to come across. And the thing is, in the end of, at the end of the day, no matter how awesome your colors are, it's those shapes that really matter. And um, the tricky thing in the noton without a third tone, like we're going to begin with, is that you can't really judge every single area in the painting. Um, you can't differentiate all of them. And that's kind of what makes it fun and challenging and creates surprising and interesting results sometimes is that, you know, normally we would want to differentiate kind of where maybe the eyes are or like the right side of the head from the background. But the background's not particularly light, um, especially compared to the foreground. And we want to separate background and foreground. So we just lose that whole edge. And that is what makes notons really fun and, and distinctive when you paint a noton. In fact, there's a whole school of people that really enjoy just painting notons. And um, the more sophisticated you get with your shapes and your brushwork and your confidence, the more interesting notons get. So if you don't like notons right now, I would suggest giving it some more time. You know, they get more interesting the more you do them. And they get more useful the more you do them. I'd say it might be the most useful tactic that you have in your tool belt to approach a painting um, because it's, it's so simple and that doesn't mean that it's easy, you know? So what I've done here is I've blocked out the background and differentiated the head from the background. That's kind of like the main thing of a portrait, right? Is you want to, you want to focus on the person. And then I got the shadow that kind of runs from his hat across his face here. And this brush is probably too big to get into the intricacy of the shadows of facial details. Um, but I do want to get into that during the noton because I want to know where the proportions are so that when I go in with color and, and uh, other sub values and stuff, I know what to do. Um, so even though the brush is big, 
I'll at least block in a spot where the where I think the mouth would go. Um, and what I want to do is like take another look at the hat and find the shadows that go across the hat and differentiate the front of the hat from the top of the hat. Um, there's a lot of shadows in the ear as well. I want to be sure to get those. And um, I can't really differentiate the neck from the shirt because they're both in light, even though they're distinctly different colors and values. So when you wash your brush, you know, keep some water nearby when you're using gouache and acrylic. Dab the brush out, get as much paint off as possible, and then wipe it on a rag. Um, you want to minimize the amount of paint that you wash down a sink. One, because it'll clog your drain. Two, because it's not really great for the environment. And three, because in some areas you're literally not allowed to. So know your kind of local ordinances about that. Um, and this also helps kind of reduce waste and stuff too, which is good. Um, now that's relatively clean. It doesn't have to be perfectly clean. I just want to go in with white. And um, I want to cover the whole canvas with some kind of paint. I don't have to wait for it to fully dry either because it's acrylic and it dries really fast. So you can layer up really quickly. If there's an area that's particularly wet, what I'll do is I'll go all the way up to the edge, but not really over it. And I'll come back again and revisit that. Um, I'm fairly confident that I got a lot of this where I want it, but when you paint black and white, um, and that allows you to rejig re the shapes and um, kind of revisit areas. So if you need to change a shape, you can use uh, white as kind of the, the eraser, right? And you can cut back into shapes to make it more interesting. Um, you'll notice that the white's a little transparent and that there is a little halftone beginning to emerge. Um, we may want to go back over again and, and do a second layer of white, but we also want to avoid a lot of paint buildup early on uh, because we, we can take this, this note on and then paint and color on top of it. And that's going to be what we'll do in, in sort of part two um, of this whole segment. And here I'm still using a big brush because I still have large areas to cover. And I'll switch to a smaller brush soon and rework some of these areas in more detail. Um, one of the things that you'll notice about this is that it's a very two-dimensional uh, approach, right? It's very like graphic design-ish. If you look at the work of Shepard Ferry, a lot of his work hinges on notons. And you'll see people use these things kind of as finished pieces. Sometimes they'll add textures into these areas. Um, and it kind of comes back to this, uh, this sort of thing. The other thing that you can do when you work on notons is kind of like squint at the picture um, or your reference. When you squint at that, it compresses the value range. And it's easier to see what is in light and what is in dark. Um, and I can't emphasize that enough. Just squinting takes out saturation. It takes out a lot of the color and it simplifies what's in all these areas. I think I'm probably going to eliminate the cigarette at least early on. I could put it back later, but it's kind of in the way of judging a lot of the shapes. So I don't really need to put it in there um, right at the beginning. One of the things that's very distinctive about this is that the shadow wraps across his face and then over the nose. And I want to be sure to, to get that shape. You know, the initial stab at the lips was too big because the brush is very large. So I needed to make that a little smaller. Um, and then I need to bring back that shadow that goes from the nose down to the corner of the mouth and try to be really distinctive about that. Um, you may need, if you really want to be specific about this particular stage, like you might need a really teeny brush, uh, especially working on this scale. But I don't recommend getting that out too early. Um, you know, just like we're working large areas to small areas, you also want to work with large brushes to small brushes. And um, a lot of painting is, 
you know, is done that way. And, and you can be very successful if you work in certain progressions, right? Like you can say, well, I'm going to work big areas to small areas, large brushes to small brushes. I'm going to work from the sky all the way up to the foreground. And doing that, I think, really helps. <coughs> Excuse me. So here, I needed to revisit the way that the, the chin and the shadow on the um, sweater kind of meet. And then I need to make that um, shadow over at the armpit a lot, a lot smaller. And for the next layer, I may need to make it even smaller than it is there. Um, relatively speaking, it can be pretty, pretty tiny in this painting. So when you engage with this for yourself, that's when all of this will start to make sense. One of the one of the one of my favorite things that one of my pa painting teachers says is, you know, none of this means anything until you work with it on your own, and and he's very right about that. You know, like you, you got to start putting this into practice, and then you, some things will start to click and will start to make sense. So the main thing about no tons really is being decisive. And even if your decision is wrong, if you're decisive, that's a better, that's a better place to be. Um, if the shape is a little off, you know, that's okay. Like, I'd rather the shape be a little off, but you made a, a strong statement about it. Like you're saying like, this is where the shadow is. This is what I think the shape is, you know. And go through your painting just saying, you know, this is, this is what I think, and this is what I see. That's, um, that's a fun mentality to get into. Now we're going to move into what's new about this segment. So we've established a basic noton. And this next part is going to be really interesting because now we're going to add a third tone. Um, and I call this the noton with half tone, even though in other situations, half tone means something else. So literally this is halfway between black and white. Um, no tons t tend to be up to four values. Um, usually by the time you get into a fifth value, you're doing something else and you might as well shoot for a full um, grayscale painting. Um, what I want to do here is differentiate bits of the background to make the background shapes more interesting because right now it's just this really boring flat black background and I don't want to preserve that through the whole painting. So some of this is a note to self to say, hey, do something with the background to make the background interesting uh, later on in the painting. Um, I don't need to paint any individual people in the background because again, this is a portrait and it's about this guy. Um, but I can throw in some of the colors that are in the background to develop interesting uh, color relationships between background and foreground. Um, with color later on, we're gonna do a local color, um, which is a simplified method of using color um, that you see in animation and cartoons a lot. What's interesting too about this portrait is if you kind of squint at it, the, the from the hat all the way down through most of the head to the jaw is almost a straight line. And I think that's really distinctive about this particular photograph. By the way, this photograph is from earthsworld.com and you should go uh, use that person's website because it is fantastic. It's all these candid shots of people at like county and state fairs and, and um, it's basically just someone doing a lot of people watching and he puts these up for, uh, I assume it's a he, it may not be. Um, the, per the person that runs it um, just puts all these stuff all these things up and if you tag them in Instagram a lot of times uh, they will feature um, artists who use the work so um, check out that website it's it's really fun you know I love painting your everyday regular person a lot of people like painting celebrities I don't think that's particularly interesting you know because um, people are people regular people are interesting and they have a lot of interesting head shapes and and you find a lot of character out there in the world. Um, 
So now what we're doing is we're going to differentiate some values within this uh, actual portrait. So this is going to allow me to differentiate the front of the hat. And then I can get a little bit of halftone on the brim of the hat as well. Kind of brush that across. Maybe do a little bit of a gradient um, with a little dry brushing. And then now I have to really get in there and think like, what am I going to need to differentiate in the face and in the shirt or the sweater? Um, how do I want to approach this? You know, I see an obvious plain differential, differential on the left side of the cheek. And you can see the highlight on the cheekbone area um, with the fat deposits on the cheek. And so I think my approach is going to be to work a half tone around that highlight because it's a little bit darker and the color is more saturated there. So I think I want to approach it like that. And that helps me differentiate the front and the side as well. And then I want to carry that down into the underside of the chin as well and onto the neck. And then I can use a little bit of half tone on the chin, some on the lip, maybe. Now I have to get really specific about where that half tone is going to go. I can push this back around and I can reverse it and go back into using black, white, and this gray and push these around further, um, which I would suggest that you consider doing. So I think the front plane of the nose is kind of a candidate for a half tone, as is the front plane of the left nostril or the right nostril. Then I think there's a good amount of opportunity for halftone in the ear. We don't want the ear to be the emphasis, right? And here is where you get really finicky, really specific, because now you're working in a whole range that you haven't before. Now I think there's an opportunity for some half tones in the sweater. Um, there's just a slight difference in the light and medium areas of the sweater itself. And I think I want to accentuate that and exaggerate that so that I remind myself later on that, hey, I noticed some differences in the sweater. It's not just a flat value. There's transition going on within these textures. And these are also big, um, bigger shapes of halftone. I guess there'd be technically medium shapes relative to the whole area. So that's gonna help with my shape language too because now I have some big shapes, some medium shapes, and some small shapes in all three values. So it's kind of like balanced between the three values right now, which I which I think is really good. You know, it's one of the things that, we're, that you're kind of going for is unity and balance um, through your value ranges and everything. And, um, here, I think I missed, I like lowered the shoulder too high. So I wanted to bring that up a little bit with the black and kind of just, now it's like you're looking for little tweaks, little details that can make things a little bit better. Um, small shapes that you can get in that are distinctive and characteristic. Even after this is done, you know, when you go on to the next stage, when you're working in color, you can still come back and ch make big changes, you know, like narrating over this now, um, having not seen this for a day, um, I think the hat, the top of the hat is too large of a shape in the painting. So what I might do is come back and pull the background over it and change that shape again. Um, because it's also like the shape of the brim, the front of the hat and the top of the hat are all about the same size. And that's kind of boring to have them take up the same amount of space. So I might need to change that. There's always like little things that you notice the next time you come back around that make you want to change what you're doing. So have a good, have a, a good look at that and have fun painting.